Hello, my name is Michael Luke. Last weekend, I was fellowshipping with brethren and sisterin out at Camp Mishawana and ended up dialoguing with a Mexican grandfather, watching his grandchildren play at the park. And he had his Spanish Bible and I my new King James. And we were iron sharpening iron. And a question came up in uh, Luke chapter 23, the thief on the cross account. And his understanding, his end times um, beliefs are slightly different than my own. And he pointed out that in Greek, there is no punctuation marks. So the punctuation marks have been added to our English Bibles. So specifically in verse 43 of chapter 23, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And in my New King James, the comma is placed, I say to you, comma, today you will be in, with me in paradise. His understanding was, I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. And we agreed that no matter how the end times plays out, it's good to be on the good side, the light side, not playing for the dark side. And we nodded and smiled and agreed. Um, we also talked about the rich man and Lazarus over in Luke chapter 16. And the parable states that in verse 20, 16, verse 22, so it was the beggar died and was carried off by angels to Abraham's bosom. Underline Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried and being tormented in Hades, underline Hades, and lifted his eyes up and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So in my mind, I could interpret that as a pre-hell and a pre-heaven. Abraham's bosom would be the pre-heaven, waiting room outside of the real heaven, and um, uh, what's the Hades is the pre-hell. And jumping over to uh, Revelation chapter 20, which Daniel Ambush Wallace graphically shared with us, 20 verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So I'm concluding that Hades, the temporary holding spot for bad guys, results in transfer to the lake of fire, which is the real hell. So I was sort of giving the Mexican grandfather the nod with his interpretation back to Luke 2343 that perhaps it is correct to interpret I say to you today comma you will be with me in paradise either way either interpretation you end up on the good side so no point in splitting hairs with Mexican grandfather we hugged and parted what's your impression you are a great question asker. And also, if you ever want some interesting emails, get on Michael's email <laughs> list. He reflects on things deeply. Basically, kind of, if I get it, you're asking when do Old Testament saints get to heaven? Is that what you're asking? Because... Or we, even, or even um, people that die in present time, okay. do they instantly go to heaven, or do they also end up in Abraham's bosom, a waiting place for Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment, Bema seat of Christ, to take place and actually divide the sheep from the wolves 
lions from the lambs that one set goes to heaven, the real heaven, and the other gets cast into the lake of fire, not into Hades, a temporary bad guy waiting zone. Now, now you're getting into quite a few questions there, so uh, don't well, get too many. Well, that's why I hopped up first. Okay, <laughs> because you, you just blurred together. Uh, there are at least, well, depending on who's counting, seven different judgments that are talked about, and they're not the same, and they're all... So let's, I'll, I'll peel this a little bit at a time, uh, and Michael's questions, let me get back to it, are wonderful. Uh, first of all, he got with the thief on the cross, and he's very correct. Uh, not only is there not punctuation in Greek manuscripts, uh, the, there are forms of Greek manuscripts that there is even no spaces between the words. And uh, there are two kinds of manuscripts, unseals and minuscules. And uh, I'll, they, if you look at the text, they are just, uh, you know, side by side, um, you know, the characters, there's no space between them. They're just strung. Uh, and you have to actually, which is no problem. If, if I wrote in English, and it kind of looks like that probably to you, because you know English, you can tell even if they're run on what they are. But for us, it's very complex. So there's not only no punctuation, there's not even space uh, in some forms of the manuscripts. It's just all continuous uh, word or uh, letters. Okay, let's start with Luke 23, if everybody's there. Uh, does it matter in Luke 23 whether there's a comma in one place or another? Because both are true. He said it today, Luke 23, uh, 43, and he said, and surely I say unto you today, um, or I say unto you today, that you will be with me in paradise. When would that be? When did Jesus go to paradise? Uh, that's one part of Michael's question. Uh, when, when do the Old Testament saints go to paradise? What is paradise? Because paradise shows up in Revelation. Uh, and it also shows up in Persian mythology. All the suicide bombers are hoping to wake up in paradise with 70 virgins. I mean, there's lots of paradise. Uh, in fact, the word paradise is, uh, is actually a um, Persian word. Uh, so, it, I mean, it's just fascinating. So, number one, the short answer for you, Michael, is uh, the Bible says this. Uh, number one, uh, uh, the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. So in the New Testament, when any believer is absent from their body, they are present with the Lord. And Paul said that to the Corinthians with great uh, assurance. So we'll, we'll look at uh, the New Testament believers there's no question. Uh, it's an instantaneous walking from this life into the presence of the Lord with Jesus meeting us before we go. That's what Psalm 23 says. When I'm facing the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou, the good shepherd, Lord Jesus, are with me. And because he promised to be with us, Hebrews 9 says that we all have an appointment. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. So the instant we have an appointment with death, everyone does, saved and lost. Uh, no one lives a moment too soon. Psalm 139 says every day of our life is written. So we all have an appointment with death. But for us who are in Christ, before that appointment, in the waiting room, Jesus comes to walk us through. The lost go alone, and it's horrible. And if you've read any of the accounts of the rich and famous deaths, it is horrible. Uh, how they scream and cry and, you know, act horrified. But for us, the good shepherd himself comes through for this moment. So, I mean, that's clear. And I'll put, it's Second Corinthians. Um, we know and we are assured, Paul said, that to be absent from the body uh, is present with the Lord. Let me just find it. Uh, we are always confident it's verse 6. So 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says that. But really what Michael's getting after is the second question is, what about the Old Testament saints? Where and when uh, do they get to heaven? 
Um, that's the real crux of this. Now, this one, Roman Catholic theology teaches uh, limbo, limbus actually, but people, uh, non-Latin speakers call it limbo. You know, you say, it, my house is in limbo. That comes from a Latin term of Catholicism. Uh, limbus, and there are two of them, infantum in Latin, that's where babies go that didn't get baptized. And then there's limbus patrum, and that's where uh, the Old Testament, um, you know, the, the, the people that are before the church, the Old Testament saints, go to limbus patrum and limbus infantum, and then believe, or, uh, good Roman Catholics go to purgatory, except for saints, and saints go directly to heaven. Okay, so the Catholics have quite a, um, saints go to heaven, everybody else goes to purgatory, except for uh, people outside of Christianity that were righteous, like, you know, someone that hears about Christ, they go to Limbus Patrum, the Old Testament saints, and then babies go there. The problem is none of the, all of this line isn't in the Bible. There's no purgatory, it's only in the Apocrypha. So that's why the Roman Catholics steadfastly believe in the Apocrypha because they need the Apocrypha for purgatory because it's not in the New Testament. Christ never talked about a place of purgation with fire for believers to get rid of their remaining sin. I mean, that sounds like Jesus didn't pay at all. And that's the whole problem with, with all of these uh, things. And so Limbus, this limbo thing, is a waiting room for heaven and uh, the saints will get you there um, I don't know how, Michael, how did you get us on all these, copy, or these topics? But there is what's called the super arrogation of, and this is all Roman Catholicism, that's why people are so um, confused about the destination. The super arrogation of the saints is that the saints have more uh, goodness, um, merit, they call it, they have more merit then they need to get to heaven. It's kind of like if a ticket to heaven costs $100, they have 200. What do you do with the other 100? It goes into the supererogation, goes into a treasury of merit, a treasury of merit, that if you pray uh, and have a, a mass for a loved one that's in limbo or purgatory, the supererogation comes to them in either limbo or purgatory wherever they are, and we'll buy them out and they'll get to go to heaven. So that's, that's why it's so confusing. So just to say there is no place of Old Testament people today that are, whoa, hiding, like that word is, or there's no place for the babies, and there is no purgatory anywhere. So what happens to Old Testament saints? At John, Abraham's bosom is how that whole waiting room got yeah, the, in the topic. And, and I will, what is Abraham's bosom and what is paradise? So, first of all, Abraham's bosom is described in Luke 16 if you believe it's not a parable. See, the first thing Michael is talking about is those that don't like the interpretation of Luke 16 say that it's a parable. And so it's not teaching doctrine. It's just a story, and, and every part of it is just a story, and it's not doctrinal. Uh, if you follow that, then it doesn't matter what Abraham's bosom is. It's just the description of a nice place, and the one that's in the fire, uh, the grave or Hades, uh, is in a bad place. But I personally follow those Bible teachers that believe that Luke 16 is not a parable because it doesn't follow the parabolic pattern. In the parables, no people are mentioned by name. They're always so certain and some and everything else. And we have Dives, a rich man, and Lazarus. We have a person named. It's the only parable where someone's named. So it makes it an atypical parable, and so it's probably that Jesus wasn't giving a parable. He was talking about known people that everyone would have related to and was teaching us just what Michael's asking. 
What is Abraham's bosom and what is the grave, the place of fire? Remember the rich man said, uh, look at Luke 16 if you're not already there. He says um, in Luke 16, so many uh, interesting details. Uh, the beggar died and was carried by angels, in verse 22, to Abraham's bosom, that's that term, and the rich man died and was buried and in torment in Hades. So he's in the, the place of fire of torments and in the place called Hades, he lifts up his eyes so he has conscious existence. No one ceases to have conscious existence. Now we get into another error. Have you ever heard of soul sleep? I mean, that's the, the error of this, this idea of soul sleep, that people cease to consciously exist. And, and that's not in the Bible either. No one has soul sleep. Everyone in the Bible is conscious in one of two places in the Old Testament. So here's the Abraham's bosom. In the Old Testament, Luke 16 is a New Testament look into this Old Testament world. There's a place of comfort, and there is a place of discomfort. And Jesus is saying that Lazarus uh, was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, the place of comfort, and this rich man in verse 23 saw him afar off, at, you know, and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, which, which what it means is that Abraham was there, and that he was comforting this newcomer, Lazarus, you know, in his bosom is, you know, like hugging and close. And uh, so you've read the story. The, the rich man is in torment. So what is going on here? And let me stick a page in there to get through this. Number one, at the instant of death, Old Testament inhabitants either went to the grave uh, which uh, the bad side of the grave is this place of torments, and there are many passages on this. Uh, let me show you just one, Ezekiel 32. It's really an awful place, and uh, be thankful. Now, Ezekiel, you know, it's just before Daniel, and look at Ezekiel 32. It says that everyone that's ever lived is down in this place. Uh, Ezekiel 32 starting in verse 17. This is the abode of the dead. Uh, and verse 18, a wail over the multitudes of Egypt, cast them down into the depths of the earth. So Ezekiel 32, starting with verse 18. It's called the depths of the earth. So this place is down deep in the earth. The second thing it's called is in verse 18 at the end, those who go down to the pit. So it's called a pit. And in, in, if you keep reading, verse 21, the strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of, verse 21. What does your Bible say, out of the midst of where? What does it say in verse 21 in your Bible? Out of, say it again. Uh, Sheol. Is it S-H? Is that what you're saying? I can hardly hear through the... Is it Sheol? Yeah, okay. So there's another word. Sheol. Uh, the New King James says hell. Now that's where... Now that's another thing Michael brought up. Uh, who got into hell when? And is anybody there now? So in the Bible, the abode of the dead is called at times the grave at times Sheol, which is the abode of the dead, often, all the way through this, look at verse 23 of Ezekiel 32, her, grave, her graves are set in the recesses of the, what does verse 23 say? Pit. The pit, okay, you got pit in your uh, version. Look at verse 24, they have gone down uncircumcised to the lower parts of the earth. First we had, you know, the depths. Now we have lower parts. But always, always, they're not out there somewhere in the Milky Way. Always, the Bible says, everyone that's ever lived is still here on this planet. They don't go other places. They're here. In the Old Testament, everyone from Adam and Eve, Noah, etc., 
all were in the same place. They were in the happy side of this place, the happy side of the grave, the happy side of the pit, the happy side down deep in the lower parts of the earth. They were in the grave. So it, it's all, everyone goes there. When David's son, through Bathsheba, died, David said, I'm going to go to him in the grave. Yet David said, I'm going to awaken in your likeness, but I'm going to go to him. Now, for a moment, look at the last chapter of 1 Samuel, because this is, uh, or the second to the last, because this is the conclusive evidence of this. Um, it, in 1 Samuel 25, Samuel died. Where did he go when he died? Well, Saul, chapter 28, not the last. Let's go to 1 Samuel 28. Uh, Saul died. He dies back in 25 of 1 Samuel. Where did he go? Chapter 28 shows us. This witch in Endor does a seance, calls for Samuel to come. Now, she had no doubt she'd get Samuel because all witches work with the devil, with the occult, with the demons, with Satan. And if they can get people to believe they're calling up, you know, whoever they're calling up, all, all these, these uh, uh, witchcraft people are doing things that are supernatural because they're working with the demons. That's why God always says we're not supposed to have anything to do with astrology, the occult, witchcraft, mediums, anything to do with it. Why? Because it's real. And when they go to have their seances, there are real beings that come up. So this woman was used to it, and she was going to do her thing and have Samuel come up because demons impersonate, and a demon could impersonate anyone. Why? Because a demon is an immortal spirit that's a, an intelligence. The word daimon means intelligence. They are so smart, it only takes a baby a few months to learn a language. Can you imagine if you're thousands of years old, what you know? If you don't have to sleep, and if all you do is just hang around and listen to everything and follow everybody, you know where every hidden everything is. So demons are very powerfully smart, and they can impersonate anybody. And so it, it says, uh, uh, when Saul inquired, verse 6 of the Lord, the Lord wouldn't answer. So he said uh, uh, to this woman, he disguised himself in verse 8, and says, uh, Please conduct a seance for me at the end of verse 8. Bring up the one I shall ask. And, and she says, who do you want? And uh, she, he says, Samuel, in verse 11, bring up Samuel for me. Now look at verse 12. Here's the, the proof. When the woman saw Samuel, she went, there's Samuel. She, she did this all the time. She was a pro at seances and calling up the dead. She screamed, verse 12, with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul and said, What have you, you've deceived me. You're Saul. And the king said to her, Don't be afraid. What did you see? Now look at verse 13. And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of what? Heaven? What does it say in your Bible? Yeah, coming up. Ascending is coming up from below. Uh, it don't... I saw him coming out of the earth, and, and he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped his face to the ground. And Samuel, verse 15, said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by what? Bringing me up. Where was he? Down there. Down there. So that doesn't sound very good for Old Testament saints, does it? Down there in that pit? Who wants to be there? Well, what we find is, if you really believe Luke 16, like I do, is not a parable, then the abode of the dead had two sides with a chasm between them, an uncrossable chasm. And there was the happy side, I call it the happy side of Hades, and there was the sad side. And the happy side is called Abraham's bosom. And it's where the, the saints, the Old Testament saints went. And why did they go there? Why didn't they go to heaven? I'm glad that you asked that. Look at the last verse of Hebrews 11, because the Bible always answers any legitimate question we have. Why, 
why would God not, I mean, it's clear why the lost would be in torments, because they rejected the God who stood at arm's length from every one of them their entire life. God says, I'm not far from every one of you. There's no one that's ever lived that God has been further than an arm's length from. We know that from Acts 17. So they rejected the God who sent his voice throughout the earth, as Romans 1 said, the God who, Psalm 19 says, uh, that, that, that his light has shined over all the world, the God who, John 1 says, he has lit every man that's come into the world. God has given a candle into the hand of every human that's ever been born from Adam and Eve onward. Actually, two candles. And those two candles are creation and their conscience. So every baby comes into the world holding two candles. You know, I believe this so much, I couldn't wait for my son John to be born. I was right there at Verdugo Hills Hospital waiting to see those two candles in his hand. <laughs> Actually, I found out they're invisible candles. They're not real. So for you kids watching, what I'm saying is everyone is born with the candle of conscience that if you hold it up, you see that, that you are and I am desperately wicked and you realize that, that there, there must be something out there that could help with my wickedness. And the other one is the candle of creation that we look at the whole universe and we realize there must be intelligent designer out there. And so if you say, I, I want to meet the designer, or you say, I need a savior because I am wicked, or you say, I'm wicked, I need a savior, and you must be the great God of the universe, the Lord says, I am only an arm's length away from everybody. And, and he said, whoever calls out to me will be saved. Now, no one asked me tonight whether they can call without him prompting them. I'm glad you didn't. But what I'm saying is, they're there, and there's a good reason why every lost person is there, and God is just. Why are the good people here? Well, look at the last verse of Hebrews 11, because it's so clear once you think about it. Um, I'll start in verse 39, then get to 40. And these all, having obtained a good testimony through faith, died and did not receive, what does it say? Did not receive the promise. Uh oh I think I messed up my um, board. It doesn't like me now. There we go. There we go. Hebrews 11, verse 39. They didn't receive the promise. God, verse 40, having provided something better for us. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the divide between the Old Testament and the New Testament believers. The promise to the Old Testament believers, Job is the first one that really put it at, you know, down in clear words. Job 19, where he said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the last days, though my flesh be eaten by worms, with my eyes I shall behold him. He believed in the resurrection, and he believed he was going to see God face to face. That's the promise. So the Old Testament had a promise of heaven, resurrection, and everything. But look at verse 40 of Hebrews 11 that God provided something better for us, that they, Old Testament saints, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What, what he's saying is that something had to happen between the Old Testament saints just promised and the New Testament. What, what is the dividing point? It's the cross right here. See, they could not be perfected until Christ paid the price on the cross. The Old Testament saints were, they died and went and waited down there in that place of comfort, waiting, looking forward to a substitute. Now, they didn't know his name was Jesus. It doesn't say in the Old Testament that his name was Jesus. Joseph was the first one human that got to say the name of Jesus at the circumcision of Christ. But they knew that he was Jehovah, Jehovah, Seuss. That's what Jesus is. Jehovah is my salvation. That, that's Yahashua. The Old Testament name Joshua, Yahashua, is Jehovah is my salvation. 
That's Jesus. Jesus is just a contraction of the Old Testament promise that God would provide salvation. They didn't know his name, but they look forward to this sacrificial substitutionary offering. They didn't fully understand it, but they look forward to it. But God says, everybody on this side of the cross, verse 40, God provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect, allowing to be see him like he is and be conformed to his image and all that that David hoped for and promised and said, when I awaken, I'll be like you and all that. They would not have the, all the perfections of being face to face in God's presence around his throne until after the cross. So, how did they get there? So we've got them. We've got the happy and unhappy side down here happy and sad. And we had the cross. And Jesus is talking to one next to him, and he says, I say to you today, or I say to you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now when we get to Revelation, look what it says in Revelation 2, the promise to the church. Revelation 2 if I can find it, I wish people would tell me about these questions so I could look everything up. Where does it say the paradise? It's in two or three. I, I give unto you uh, paradise in, uh, come on, who finds it first? Two, seven. Here we go. Thank you. Ah, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we found the tree of life. You know, everybody wonders what happened. Did it get washed away with the flood? No. 2.7 says, eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So up here, the paradise of God is heaven. And that's where the tree of life is. That's, we're right in Revelation 21 and 22. That talks about the river of the water of life and the tree of life and the paradise of God and the presence of God. How do they get from here to there? Well, this had to happen, but what, now, now we're getting into connecting things, but it says in Ephesians 4 and in 2 Peter, and uh, those of you that know the Apostles' Creed, where it says Jesus went to hell, or I'm not, I wasn't raised reformed, so what does it say? He descended to hell? Anybody memorize that thing? What does it say? Descended to hell. When did he do that? Well, look what, what Peter says about it. Uh, it's 7.14. Um, uh, to declare, he went down and spoke to the spirits in prison. Where is that one? What is it? Oh, 1 Peter 3.19. Sorry, I'm not, not second. First. 1 Peter 3.19. We'll... we'll We'll go back to 1 Peter 3.18, okay? 1 Peter 3.18. Let's just put all this together in one minute. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Right there, on the cross. The just for the unjust. That was what we saw this morning, 2 Corinthians 5.21. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Preached? The spirits in prison? Boy, that's getting into scary stuff. Uh, who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. Whoever's in prison are in prison having some to do with Noah and the flood. It's just amazing. And so what we do, and I'll just, uh, it's not Second Peter, it's First Peter 3. It says in Ephesians 4 that after the cross, Jesus went from the cross and took captivity captive and, and gave gifts to sons of men and all this stuff. It parallels what it says in, in Psalm 68, and it appears that what Jesus did is he went down from the cross, declared to the spirits in prison, uh, which another part of this has demons in it, that, that he had won. He picked up those Old Testament saints, he dropped them in heaven, and then on the third day, he 
came out of the tomb and in Matthew 27, he had a whole bunch of people that walked out of the tombs on resurrection morning with him. And he became the first fruits of many that were raised from the dead. So Michael, how far have we gotten from your question? Uh, Michael, where is it? Michael asks several things, and I'll just run through it real quick. Um, you hit a grand slam. No, I covered too many topics. It's, I believe that, that the thief on the cross got to go with Jesus, personally escorted, as kind of the first of the Old Testament saints. And he never got baptized. Probably, who knows if he was ever circumcised, and he came totally by faith. He became those that came out of, he became with the line of those that came out of the uh, happy side. But for us, we're not under that anymore. We're instantly absent from the body, present with the Lord. And Jesus comes to us, and there is no limbo, both in phantom or patrum, and there is no purgatory, but saints do go directly to heaven. The Catholics have that correct. But they have incorrect how you become a saint. It isn't by the merits of others. It's only by the one sacrifice of Christ. And Jesus was explaining that in that story about Lazarus. And then if someone ever asks, I'll go into who got into hell first. And, uh, and by the way, nobody's in hell right now. That's the bottom line. And there are at least seven judgments. And Michael talked about the sheep and the goats. And there's also the judgment of Israel. And there's the judgment uh, of the saints. And there's going to be the great white throne. But we didn't have time for that. Uh, but everybody that's lost is still on the earth and they're still down there, like Ezekiel 32 says. Whew. Aren't you glad you're on the right side of the cross?